Well, thank you uh, very much. The, um, the bad news is that we're a little over time. The good news is that it's actually, they're going to set out dinner for everybody since I think we've missed lunch, if that's all right with you. I, um, I will not take long because you've been very uh, patient. Uh, you've been very uh, uh, good in your attention, but it is late, and uh, we, are, we are severely time-challenged. So let me speak very briefly, and I, have, I will not actually speak very much at all about my own institution. I will actually speak about uh, the Canadian experience in internationalization of uh, education. Um, you've heard a lot today about the competitive market called international education, how it's changing, how it's growing, um, but you've also talked about the different interests that come into play uh, when you do talk about this, whether that's the institutional interests, uh, whether that's uh, institutions uh, who are trying to, in a very uh, altruistic way, trying to achieve their teaching and learning mission, whether they are, in fact, trying to climb the ranks of uh, some of those some of those tables, those league tables that we heard about this morning from, uh, from the Times uh, Higher Learning uh, tables, whether they're trying to increase their prestige or whether in fact they're trying to earn some money because that's part of it too. As our first speaker said, this isn't simply an academic exercise in internationalization. It's very much uh, an economic exercise as well, which of course brings in the government interests, whether that's national governments. Uh, Canada, like India, is a federal state and therefore we have the uh, interesting and sometimes complicated worlds of jurisdictional fights and in fact it's the case in, uh, in Canada as it is in India that education is primarily a subnational jurisdiction um, but of course the federal government uh, gets, uh, gets involved and there are some very important national interests involved when you uh, speak about education whether that's the soft power implications whether that's enhancing relationships at a diplomatic level uh, our governor general talks about the diplomacy of knowledge as being an important way of building relationships, not just between countries, but between people as well. Uh, and of course, there's the, there is the issue of talent. Uh, it's, a, it's a global challenge to get the right people in the right jobs in everybody's country, and certainly internationalization is part of that. And then, as we've talked about, there is, there is the actual dollar figures involved. How much money is this bringing into a country? How much is it, I have to say, there's an investment involved from every government that's funding education. That's an investment that sometimes pays off immediately. It sometimes pays off in years to come through, for instance, remittances, which happen to be the largest source of income in some areas of this, uh, of this country and some countries themselves. Of course, there's the private sector, uh, their interest in R&D, their interest in talent, and let us please, please, please never forget the students. Uh, which is actually what is supposed to be at the heart of this enterprise. Of course, their interests in expanding their knowledge and getting great experience uh, in immigration and getting great jobs. So the Canadian story. I heard today, I never heard this, that we we're actually an evolving destination for international students. I think that would come as a, something that was a surprise for Canadians who thought they were a destination and a f fairly fixed one. Uh, we have about, um, in, in, in global terms, about 4% of the uh, international student population. That puts us about fourth in the English-speaking world behind the U.S., the U.K., and Australia. Um, we're also second in French language because uh, uh, Canada, of course, is a bilingual country, so we are second behind France. Uh, we have um, about 70, uh, about 7.5% 7 of all of our students at the post-secondary level are uh, international. Now, that compares to a country like Australia, which has been, as, as you know, very aggressive. Uh, in positioning itself as a destination, it's got about 27% of its tertiary uh, education level international students. Uh, we, in fact, in Canada have had rapid growth uh, in recent years, but it hasn't been broad-based. In fact, a lot of that growth has come from uh, this country because of certain visa changes that our federal government has made. Now, when we talk about internationalization, of course, we're not just talking about international students, students uh, coming from <coughs> this country to that. We're also talking about countries coming from that country to this. And in that, in that score, Canada does very poorly. Only about 3% of Canadian students uh, have, do any kind of studying abroad. And most of those are, in fact, just south of our border uh, in the US or in a very familiar country to all of us, the UK. They don't necessarily travel the world uh, in any kind of particularly interesting way. So I did want to talk to you about, a, uh, because this is a, a topic of, of huge focus in Canada, there's been a recent uh, advisory panel to the federal government on international education that released, recently uh, released its report. It was headed up by one of the, uh, the presidents of one of our, our very uh, leading universities in Ontario. And I'll talk about the recommendations in a second, but it's interesting that one of their prime observations was part of the challenge of internationalizing education in Canada 
was the concern, uh, and this, is of, this matters to every politician in the crowd, the, the concern was that the people of Canada didn't understand the benefits of internationalization. And that matters particularly in a country like Canada because we have essentially no private institutions. We have all of our institutions are publicly supported. So when those are tax dollars at work, uh, the, the politicians start paying a lot of attention to what, uh, to what the people are saying. And so part of the challenge for those of us who believe deeply in internationalization is in fact to convince the public of its benefits. Now the report did uh, position us, uh, did, did, did conclude that the, uh, the Canada was well positioned in the international marketplace. And I'll give you a quote which says a lot, frankly, I think about Canada. The report, this is a report done by Canadians for Canadians, said, Canada's brand is based on consistently high quality and a reputation for excellence across the entire education sector. Canada offers international students a safe and multicultural learning environment in which they can choose to study in English or French. Compared to other countries such as the UK or the United States, Canadian tuition fees and the cost of living are quite affordable. Further, international students have the option to work during their studies and can also apply to work in Canada upon completion of their studies. I have to say, the reason I say that's typically Canadian, because we didn't say we're the best in the world, didn't say we're bigger than everybody else in the world, I actually just said we're offering high education, high quality education at a reasonable price, which actually happens to be true. Um, it's not a most exciting uh, message at one level, but it happens to be, I think, a very accurate one and a very solid one. Now, the report went on to enumerate the benefits in this, uh, of, of internationalization, and this is what, somewhat preaching to the choir, as they say, but let me just uh, talk about our basic reality in Canada, and this is a very fundamental one. That, uh, the, our demographers predict that in our future, 75% of our workforce will be coming from immigration. We are a uh, you know, mature, uh, ad advanced uh, economy, uh, mature in age, and we're not replacing our population. So we were built by immigration. We will have to continue to thrive through immigration. So our, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously makes a lot of sense if you can build as much as possible uh, that workforce from amongst your country's own graduates, including international students. We've talked about this, the significant impact, uh, economic impact of international uh, students in a country. Uh, are the estimates, the number was there earlier on the slide about the dollar value in total. Uh, the, the job value is about 85,000 jobs in Canada, if you do that kind of math, and the tax revenue alone to the Canadian government uh, is about half a billion dollars. And now education services are now our 11th largest export to the world, our leading export to China. But of course, the, uh, for, for all of us in the room who are educators, it's the, it's the teaching and learning opportunities, the rich and comprehensive internationalization that really, uh, I hope, is, our, is of prime importance to us. Uh, increasingly, I think most of us believe that a truly internationalized education system around the world is going to be the oxygen that keeps us all uh, going. In my, uh, in my world, uh, Seneca is a college, in Canadian college terms, I, I think the uh, appropriate uh, Indian uh, equivalent would be a deemed university. We are uh, we're very focused on uh, applied uh, skills, and uh, we, we create uh, job-ready, career-ready uh, employees through a variety of programs. Um, we are, in fact, focused on teaching and advanced uh, and, and applied research. So we've been involved as, as an institution for, uh, for most of our 45 years in international education, but we are evolving it. We used to just simply have a recruitment strategy, and that, that's, that was what we called international education. Uh, we have ambitions for much more and, in fact, are doing much more now as many institutions in Canada are. So we've moved from that traditional historical uh, recruitment model to one that is, um, is uh, building much richer relationships with, uh, with institutions here in India and elsewhere uh, based on uh, student exchange joint programs, faculty exchange, uh, joint research programs, uh, certainly internationalized curriculum. And that's through cross-disciplinary, experiential, flexible learning opportunities uh, for, uh, for all of our students, whether they're international or domestic. So now, let me now return to our advisory panel's recommendations to give you some insight on, uh, on the discussion that's going on in Canada. So here are the most important. One is that we don't have any substantial in Canada, any international mobility programs that are supported by government. And that partly explains why we send very few students out into the world. So for those of us who believe that internationalization has to be not just a two-way street, but a multi-pronged street, uh, they're, uh, probably, they're, for me, the most re important recommendation was that, in fact, the government set up, the, the federal government set up a fund that would, uh, that would uh, help about 
2,000 Canadian students go abroad by 2020, uh, 2022. I must say I was in Brazil last year and one of their very impressive programs is the Science Without Borders program, which is going to fund 100,000 Brazilian students to study abroad for a year over the next three years. That's, that is internationalization in action. That's a government that is putting its money where its, uh, where its mouth is. It also, the report also encouraged, and I think this is a less, uh, really, a, 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 I don't think this, the government here in Gujarat, uh, judging by the Chief Minister's remarks this morning, uh, needs any lessons in this, but for other governments around the world, and even some of ours in Canada, the report also urged that internationalization be at the heart of every government policy. So whether it's trade policy, whether it's immigration policy, whether it's research funding policies, whether it's bilateral agreements, uh, that internationalization be part of that. Quality assurance is extremely important. So, in fact, they, they <coughs> recommended a national quality assurance framework. This would uh, send the provinces uh, over the moon in terms of uh, federal uh, uh, intrusion into provincial um, uh, jurisdiction. But the reality is that for a country like Canada, which, which values uh, its, uh, its place in the international marketplace, quality means everything. It's everything to do about with our brand, uh, and it's important to protect it. Speaking of the brand and, uh, and so on, uh, the report also recommends that we be very targeted in our marketing uh, of, of uh, the Canadian advantage and certainly one of those targets uh, as it has been for several years is uh, India. Now I hadn't, didn't highlight the first recommendation but it shows you what a small country is, uh, uh, sort of has to, gra to, to grapple with. The reality is, is that uh, uh, the, their very first recommendation is that Canada double the number of uh, international students over the next uh, 20 years or so. Um, you've seen the numbers, the projections. If we, if we double our numbers, that simply keeps us at our current market share of 4%. And for those of us who are running institutions and trying to squeeze students into the corners of them, um, I'm not sure that we're ever going to have the capital to, in fact, uh, build, the, build the seats that would welcome all those students. But now, of course, uh, that's a report, and we all know that reports uh, can have many lives, including sitting on a, uh, on a shelf and gathering dust, and we're awaiting in the next couple of months a new federal budget, and we hope to see some of these, uh, some of these uh, strong recommendations, some of these, for me, very admirable recommendations actually uh, funded. So let me just conclude with, uh, with some observations uh, about the Canadian system. First is that leading uh, Canadian post-secondary institutions, you certainly saw and heard from one on the stage, the University of Toronto, a great institution, certainly one of our world-class institutions. They're actively engaged in the international market. Uh, they're evolving their, their, their relationships to that richer bilateral state uh, that, will, that I think will truly bring mutual benefits to, uh, to both institutions and, of course, most importantly, to the students at both institutions. Um, relatively speaking, Canada is, I think, well positioned because we're relatively easy to do business with. Uh, our our uh, immigration policies, because of our talent deficit, are actually quite student friendly and they're immigration friendly as well. So when the Chief Minister speaks this morning about a work, getting our workforce ready for the world, uh, Canada is, uh, is ready for them. Our positioning is strong. I think our marketing is based not necessarily on uh, bells and whistles, uh, on the sizzle, as they would stay, say, but on the stake. It's uh, very solid, uh, it delivers real value, and I think that's, that's, for me, is the lasting value proposition. And finally, if we want to um, make sure that the benefits of internationalization um, are not simply reserved for uh, a smaller, elite set of institutions and students, um, and really assure that the broader social and economic benefits of internationalization uh, are, are felt across our respective countries, uh, then we will need a deep, deep commitment from all politicians at all levels of governments in every nation uh, to both investments, but just as importantly to policy measures uh, as well. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you.